Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I would not, in my wildest dreams, have imagined that I would be here or even there. Uh, very moved. Thank you, uh, President Gertler, Chancellor Wilson, and my good friend, uh, President Emeritus Naylor, for this amazing distinction from Canada's finest university. Thank you very, very much indeed. Graduates, class of 2014, my warmest congratulations to you all. I am very honored to share this day with all of you who have earned your degrees. Uh, my daughter Angie, who's here with us, is also a graduate of this institution, and I know uh, that you are here because of much hard work and sleepless nights. At least that's what she's told me. <laughs> Speaking at special events like this is daunting. I have to tell you, I had many sleepless nights wondering what on earth I was going to tell you that you might even vaguely remember tomorrow morning. Engineers, as you know, are not known for great oratory or lengthy speeches. Uh, when Orville and Wilbur Wright, uh, pioneers of the first flying machine, were invited to dinner to celebrate their success, the host of the evening invited Orville to say a few words. Orville stood up and said, Wilbur will speak. <laughs> Wilbur then took the podium and said, Orville just did, and sat down. <laughs> Now that's brevity, you remember. I suspect some of you are feeling, why doesn't she sit down right about now? <laughs> I'm gonna make it simple. Be excellent. Excellence is the hallmark of the University of Toronto. You are part of a great tradition. Never, ever forget it. Excellence has underpinned my own journey as an engineer, and an educator. So let me tell you a story of how the seeds of excellence were planted in my life. The story begins in a town actually not far from here, Alora, Ontario. Alora was the birthplace of a remarkable Canadian woman named Mary Irwin. She was among Canada's first female doctors when she graduated from the Toronto Medical College for women in the mid-1890s. She went to New York for postgraduate work, and there she met and married Dr. Samuel Ratnam, and she traveled to Ceylon with him, now Sri Lanka, my birthplace, to be a medical missionary. The Ceylon that Mary Irwin encountered troubled her a great deal. She found that women had few rights, only 3% of them could read, and so she founded several organizations to promote literacy for girls, led the charge for women's right to vote, opened a hospital, and the first family planning clinic for women. Her official obituary in 1962 read, Canada has sent many daughters to Ceylon, but the greatest gift was Dr. Mary Irvin Ratnam. Now, Mary Irvin's life and mine are linked in the most remarkable of ways. You see, Dr. Samuel Ratnam, the man she met in New York and married, was my great grand uncle. Aunt May, as my father called her, had a profound influence on him since she changed the landscape for women in Sri Lanka. That came to light when I bravely announced as a teenager that I wanted to be an engineer. My father and mother did not say, are you crazy? Women don't become engineers. Instead, they encouraged me to pursue my dream. Looking back, looking back, my sense of excellence has been shaped by the lives of individuals like Mary Ratnam, 
who pushed boundaries in ways that have had profound impact years and years and years after they have moved on. Which is why I love the following quotation on excellence. Excellence can be attained if you risk more than others think is safe, care more than others think is wise, dream more than others think is practical, and expect more than others think is possible. In choosing a career in mechanical engineering as a woman in the late 60s, I took a risk. One you take, I suppose, when you're young and idealistic. I had no idea what engineers did either. There were no girls in my class, but I had plenty of dates. <laughs> it was risky to change fields yet again and move into metallurgical engineering for my PhD. But the risk led me to a fascinating world of steel processing, and I was able to apply principles of mechanical engineering to this new field, which helped change industry standards and eliminate defects in continuous casting of steel. Taking risks is so fundamental to achieving excellence. Without it, you cannot push boundaries. I think of Elsie McGill, a graduate of the University of Toronto in 1927, the first Canadian female electrical engineer. She contracted polio and faced the prospect of spending her life in a wheelchair. But Elsie was not to be deterred. She threw herself into aeronautical engineering, seeking excellence. She helped Canada become a global leader in aircraft manufacturing during World War II. She was dubbed the queen of hurricanes because of her contribution to the Hawker Hurricane aircraft. Now the second path to excellence is to care more than others think is wise. I learned this firsthand from my father who was an ear, nose and throat surgeon. He toiled away in a third world country caring for tens of thousands of extremely poor patients in large, seriously underfunded public hospitals. When I was growing up, he uncovered a bioelectric disturbance in the inner ear, which he linked to a severe condition called Meniere's disease, responsible for debilitating dizziness. He then devised a minor operation to quell the bioelectric disturbance, which brought unimaginable relief to his patients. I remember his excitement when his work was accepted for publication in a prestigious Swedish journal. I was trying to study for my final exam in engineering, grappling with the complexities of the second law of thermodynamics, and he would pop into my study at all times wanting to talk about dizziness. I couldn't help but be struck by his passion and his deep caring for his patients. His caring was the driving force for excellence. I knew then that I too wanted to pursue research and make a difference, but I could not stand the sight of blood, and so it was not going to be in medicine. Excellence can also be achieved if you dare to dream. Dream big, but this often has its birth in failure. I was a mediocre athlete at best in high school, and I remember coming in dead last in the 400-meter race at a provincial track and field meet. Now, this is not like the 100-meter dash, where no one really notices who came last. In the 400-meter race, I was still running long after everyone had crossed the finish line. I came home, and I said to my parents, I quit. And I can't remember whether it was my father or mother or both of them, they said, if Wilma, if Wilma Rudolph can win three Olympic gold medals, what's the matter with you? Don't you love it when your parents just say the darndest thing? You've just come last and they're talking about gold medals. The only people in the world with illusions for you, absence of any evidence of talent. <laughs> By the way, graduates, your parents are feeling particularly delirious right about now it would be a good time to ask for money. <laughs> uh, 
And also, if you're thinking of moving out, don't. It's a big mistake. Nothing beats the deal you have right now. <laughs> now back to Wilma Rudolph. She was an African-American from Tennessee, born severely premature. She contracted polio and wore a brace until she was nine. The 20th of 22 children. Her father was a railway porter, her mother was a maid. She overcame enormous odds, competed and won three gold medals in track and field in 1960 in the Olympic Games in Rome. She was known throughout the world as the tornado, fastest woman on earth. And after she retired, she became a civil rights activist. Wilma Rudolph dreamed more than others thought it practical. I never became a much better athlete, but I did not quit. And to this day, her story has stayed with me. Finally, finally, excellence is born of high expectations. Have you ever wondered why the University of Toronto's Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering building is called the Sanford Fleming Building? Who was he? Sanford Fleming was a Canadian engineer who missed a train on a July afternoon in 1876 at Bandoran, Ireland because of a misprint in the railway guide which read 5.10 p.m. instead of 5.10 a.m. The misprint cost him 16 hours. A night at the Bandoran station missed connections to a ferry to England. Missing that train turned out to be a lucky misfortune for humanity because Fleming became preoccupied with the concept of time. He concluded that the error was symptomatic of an imperfect system. He expected a higher standard. He expected more than others had even imagined possible. His idea for time zones and their relationship to longitude was born. There was great resistance to his concept, but by 1929, all the major countries in the world had accepted the concept of time zones. Can you imagine a world without it? Canadian inventors and engineers, like Sanford Fleming, have punched above their weight. You will too, you will too, if you pursue excellence. I cannot count the times people who notice my iron ring ask me, are you a Canadian engineer? And I wear it pr proudly as a symbol of a great profession. So let us not forget our obligations, beautifully captured in the words of Rudyard Kipling in the ritual of the calling of an engineer. The obligation was commissioned in 1922 at the request of Professor Holtain from the University of Toronto. Since then, it has been enshrined in the engineer's iron ring ceremony. Let me recall a few lines of this powerful promise. My time I will not refuse. My thought I will not grudge. My care I will not deny towards the honor, use, stability, and perfection of any works to which I may be called to set my hand. Graduates, as you leave today, reflect on these high principles. Above all, risk more, care more, dream more, and expect more, and your reward will be extraordinary excellence, excellence that changes the world. Congratulations to you all.